everyone. So for today's lecture, we're going to be looking at the Industrial Revolution. This is the period really what we're looking at after the Civil War um, in which America's industry and America's economic power grew exponentially. Um, and this is where we really see the America that we know today, the most powerful economy in the world, um, really the captain of industry for the entire world, grows in this post-war period. The Industrial Revolution began in the 18th century in Great Britain, and we began to see some of the aspects of industrialization, especially in the North, um, in the 1800s and the 19th century, but it wasn't until after the war when there was really a huge boom in what is known as the Industrial Revolution in America is between 1870 and 1900. Um, so between 1860 and 1880, manufacturing output grew from 1.7 to 18 billion. So almost 10 times um, from by 1880, you see that most Americans are no longer farmers. Over half of Americans are not farmers anymore. Um, you know, America for, you know, since the colonies had been based on farming for a lot of people, people have moved away from farming. And then finally, by 1890, two thirds of Americans worked for wages. Um, they were wage workers working factories, working for companies, things like that. But of course, working for wages wasn't all great for everybody. Let's look at some stories of some people who worked in this early industrial era. Um, here's a story of Stefan Leveroni. He was a six-year-old who worked with his family making violets. Um, they would make out of cloth, make violets to sell. They worked 72 hours a week, 12 hours a day, six days a week. And as a family of five, they could make about 80 cents a day. That's about $20.23 uh, $20 today for a family of five, five people, including six-year-olds. So you see people are stuck kind of um, stuck to their wages. They can't get away. They, uh, they're they barely making enough money to live. Which is a big issue of this day is the use of child labor. Um, and we see that here with Daisy Langford. Uh, Daisy Langford was an eight-year-old who was employed working 60 hours a week putting lids on cans. So all she did for 60 hours a week was put a lid on a can. Um, their bosses said that she could not keep up and could only put on 40 lids each minute. So she averaged 40 lids a minute. But this means that she put 24,000 lids on each day. So think about the repetitiveness of that, earning a wage, 60 hours a week, putting lids on. You think listening to these lectures is boring? But what we see is that there is a lot of pushback, and there are people who violently protest against this new way of life. Louis Ling was one of those people. He was a German immigrant in Chicago, and he was an anarchist to believe in the idea of having no government. So he was supporting workers' rights at a haymarket hay riots. These were riots in Chicago, workers' riots. Um, and he was arrested after a bomb detonated in the crowd, killing seven police officers. He was sentenced to execution, and at his execution, he bit down on a blasting cap before he could be executed, blew half his face off. He died six hours later after writing Hooray for Anarchy on the wall with his blood. Um, so this is someone who was openly in protest, openly, um, violently fighting this new way of life. There were also opportunities for improvement in life. Mary Anton's life kind of tells a story of that. She was a Jewish immigrant from Belarus. She would actually worked as an indentured servant for three years prior to moving to America. She, she had worked as a servant to be able to get to this country. As a 13 year old, she enlisted in kindergarten. It's pretty old for a kindergartner. And she actually flew through school in four years. She graduated from kindergarten all the way through school in four years, and she became a well-known author and poet became a model citizen of society. So you could see how her being able to immigrate and move up in society as part of the American dream. The Industrial Revolution and the growth of industry also allowed people to get very rich. So we have that with the example of Gustavus Swift. Swift dropped out of school in eighth grade. He opened a butcher shop uh, by the age of 18, he, uh, by the age of 16. He invented a refrigerated rail car which made his business grow and his company specialized in making processed meat, soap, glue, fertilizer, margarine, hairbrushes, etc. And he actually employed 21,000 people by the time the company had grown. His company was worth 135 million when he passed away in 1903. So you see someone who's dropping out of school can start his company and build this company to the point of being worth hundreds of millions of dollars. So the question becomes, what were the causes of this Industrial Revolution? How did this occur and how did it grow in the United States so greatly? 
One of the reasons the Industrial Revolution grossed so quickly in the United States was because of government support. The government had land grants to railroads, enforced high tariffs, they broke up strikes and worked against workers, and they had a system known as laissez-faire. The government was willing to give land to the railroads to help the railroads grow. Um, the government gave 129 million acres, basically 7% of the continental land mass of the United States to railroads. That equals out to $391 million um, given to the Continental Railroad in land. That way, the railroads were able to grow and grow industry along the way. The, the government was responsible for giving them a huge amount of land and helping that industry grow. The government was also willing to side with companies, side with business owners over the rights of workers, and they were willing to break up strikes. So when workers um, went on strike to, get, to try to get better wages, try to get better um, conditions, the government was willing to go in and break those strikes up. That happens three times in important strikes. So the first one was the Great Railroad Strike. This is in 1877, and this is um, a upheaval that happens when the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad had cut wages for the third time in a year, and the, the workers went on strike, um, basically shut down the railroad for 45 days until local and state militias with the help of federal troops came in and broke them up. Uh, the Homestead Strike was in 1892. This was a violent labor dispute, a strike against the Carnegie Steel Company in Pittsburgh. Um, and they were basically trying to get better wages for steel workers. Uh, the government, once again, sent federal troops in to break it up. And then finally, the Pullman strike, which happened in 1894. This was another um, railroad worker strike, and it led to a huge amount of unrest. And once again, the federal government sent in troops to break up the strike. Um, the president, Grover Cleveland, actually created the holiday of Labor Day as a result of the strike, being like, yeah, we won't let you strike, but here, we'll give you a holiday in September. Um, and then the last, another thing that the government was willing to do was raise tariffs. Tariffs were, rose to 57% by 1900. What this was designed to do was protect industries within the United States, keep out British products, other European countries products so that the industries within the United States would grow. Final cause of the Industrial Revolution was a policy known as laissez-faire. Um, this comes from a French term, basically meaning hands-off economics. The idea is that the government will help businesses grow, but they will not get involved um, in business. Uh, they will not tell businesses how to run their business. Basically, they will stay hands off, allow the free market, allow capitalism to grow. And that's summed up in this quote by Grover Cleveland. Though the people support the government, the government should not support the people. Basically saying he's not gonna get involved with workers' rights. They are there to let capitalism grow. Lazy fair policy was also backed up by two important decisions by the Supreme Court. The first was the Wabash case. Um, this was Wabash, St. Louis Pacific Railroad versus Illinois. And what this did, the Supreme Court ruled that um, states did not have the right to control or impede interstate commerce. What that did was basically give railroads the right to travel across states to trade openly, um, again, siding with business over the rights of the state. The second important case is the case of the United States versus E.C. Knight Company. What happened in this um, case is that the Supreme Court ruled that um, it was basically an antitrust case that it severely limited the federal government's power to pursue antitrust actions under the Sherman Antitrust Act. Basically what this does is allows manufacturers to form monopolies to control whole industries. And this nullified the Sherman Antitrust Act, which was had been passed to um, to regulate monopolies, to regulate um, industry. There was also a vast amount of cheap labor in the United States to work in these industries. So between 1860 and 1900, 14 million immigrants moved to the United States. They moved for that American dream, the opportunity to work and make their own life. An um, example of them is the Fekelstein family who made garters for the Liberty Garter Company. They averaged 75 cents a day as workers. Uh, they that's about $18.96 today. Um, the mother worked until midnight. Bessie, one of the daughters, labored until 10 p.m. And Sophie, another one of the daughters, worked until 9 p.m., working every day.
There was also not just immigrants, there were also people moving from the countryside. As industry grows and people quit being farmers, they move to the cities to follow jobs. This happens today. Um, so there's an influx of people from the countryside moving to cities, moving to areas of industry. And these industries have a heavy dependence on women and children to help them run. During this period, you also see massive growth growth in corporations because of all those policies that the United States had. Um, what you really see too is the growth of what's known as vertical integration. That is controlling everything in the production process. You can see that here with Andrew Carnegie. Um, Andrew Carnegie owned the mines to mine iron ore, he owned the mills to turn that iron ore into steel, and he owned the rail and shipping lines to ship that steel out to market. So by owning all of that, his corporation is able to grow greatly. Many of these companies also integrated what was known as horizontal integration. That's basically forming in a monopoly and eliminating all competition. Basically, you take control of all of the same, the industries that do the same thing and create a monopoly or a trust. That's what's known as the Standard Oil Trust, which was owned by John Rockefeller. John D. Rockefeller owned Standard Oil, which owned 90% of everything associated with petroleum, kerosene, gas, oil. So you see that depiction here of Rockefeller controlling the railroads, controlling everything that has to do with oil production. Basically, he has control of that entire industry. So he's able to charge whatever he wants to charge. There's also a huge growth in technology during this period that allowed companies, allowed factories, allowed manufacturing to grow greatly. Um, technologies ease the amount of labor, ease the time it took to make stuff. So you can see that with two technologies warping here, which was used in textile manufacturing. And also you see the, the, the glass rolling here. This is a form of production of glass that made it way easier to produce glass. Uh, could produce more, make more money, and the technology grows. You see a massive growth of, growth of technology during this period. You also see technology such as the Bessemer Furnace. The Bessemer Furnace revolutionized the steel industry. Um, it made it way easier to take iron ore and melt it down into steel. Uh, this reduced the price of steel by about 85%. And this made it possible to build railroads, high-rises, other things that needed steel. Also see the growth of technologies that are integral to our modern life. Alexander Graham Bell invents the telephone during this period. The Wright brothers invent the airplane. Thomas Edison is responsible for building the incandescent light bulb and really kind of figuring out a lot of electrical power that we use today. So these technologies that are so integral to our modern life come about during this period, during this growth of technology. Also get new techniques along with new technology. Henry Ford, in particular, the Ford Motor Company, comes up with the idea of an assembly line. Basically, what this is, is where you get workers in a line that do the same job again and again and again. So what this allows you to do is this like what you see in a modern factory, things go down a line, do this again and again. Um, this allows things, complicated things to be man manufactured quickly, such as it took 84 steps to make a Model T Ford, which you see there. Um, that's 93 minutes to make a car. What this does is it drops the price of the vehicle by 30%. And the only paint color that you that would drive fast enough was black, so all of them are black. But what they're doing is mass producing cars for the first time. So you're gonna see these things grow. This is where we get the mass production industry that we live in today. The final things that the United States has in its advantage is that it has natural resources, such as vast oil resources, coal, iron ore to make steel, other things. They're able to draw goods out of the land to build their industry. They also have navigable rivers such as the Mississippi, the Erie Canal, the Hudson River. Um, these rivers allow them to get goods back and forth easily along with the growth of railroads. During this period of great growth, you also see a huge growth in wealth. Um, because of the growth of monopolies, these large companies, these large business owners were able to gr gain a massive amount of wealth. This is where you see some of the richest people who have ever lived. In fact, the richest man who ever lived lived during this period in the United States, John D. Rockefeller. Um, and so these people are either captains of industry, they are leading the way, or they're known as robber barons. And this is what you get a depiction here of being a robber baron, you see the men sitting on top of all their money, you know, Vanderbilt's millions, and you see the workers repressed underneath all that. 
in this political cartoon of the time, you can see the idea of these people leading industry as robber barons. Um, so it says history repeats itself. The robin, robber barons of the Middle Ages, you can see the kings and the nobles um, leading over their serfs, bringing them goods, things that they have to work for. And you see the depiction here in the robber barons of today. You see the trust. You see the monopolies. You see the tariffs. You see the fat cats of industry and the people bowing down to them, giving them wages, um, giving them tax benefits, giving them things. So the people are really held back and um, almost used as like a form of slave labor to these trusts. So let's look at someone today that could be looked at as like a modern day robber baron. That's Bill Gates. Bill Gates is worth 800,000 times more than the average American, has more than the bottom 45% of Americans. He has more wealth than the bottom 45% of people. So about 140 million people. Um, so if you want to do average from what the average person's salary is compared to Bill Gates, a Lamborghini Diablo would cost the average person about $250,000, which it does. In Bill Gates' wealth, it would cost him about 31 cents. So imagine how much I make um, compared to Bill Gates. That would, would, would have seemed like to him. He could buy every single professional sports team in the United States. He could buy every baseball team, football team, basketball team, and hockey team and only spend 35% of his income. He could stack of single dollar bills would be 2,700 miles high if he'd stacked all his money. And he actually makes income of $250 per second, makes about $20 million per day. So he is extremely wealthy. He started Microsoft, was able to build up. And he could be seen as a either captive industry for building that computer industry or as a, mo a modern day robber baron because he has so much money. But Gates doesn't even compare to John D. Rockefeller. Rockefeller is six times wealthier than Bill Gates. Rockefeller is the wealthiest private citizen in world history. He has more money than anyone who has ever lived. Um, Rockefeller at one point owned 25% of the money in, in the United States in 1902. Think about that for a second. So one in every $4, John D. Rockefeller owned that. Um, his fortune was $1.5 billion, which would equal about $339 billion today. And the reason that he had so much of this money is that he owned 90% of the oil industry. As I talked about in that horizontal integration, Rockefeller owned almost all the oil industry. He was able to control it. The Standard Oil Trust employed 60,000 people with him being at the top of it. Andrew Carnegie was also one of the richest people who ever lived. He owned the Carnegie Steel Valkyrie, but I showed you that he owned all the means of production through that vertical integration. Um, so produced 60% of the country's steel by 19,000. Carnegie made as much as 4,000 of his employees every year. So he's making huge amount of money, but he is also building the country. JP Morgan is another one of these robber barons or captains of industry. He built an investment bank um, and formed the U.S. Steel and General Electric. We still know both these companies today. Um, and JP Morgan Bank is still around today. Um, Morgan became extremely wealthy because of this. And he was actually saved the U.S. from financial panic in both 1895 and 1907. When the economy started to tank, he was able to give money to the government to bail out certain industries. That's how much money he had. So you see this depiction here of JP Morgan rowing Uncle Sam. He's bailing out the government, not vice versa. We also have Cornelius Vanderbilt, who built a massive railroad industry. He was a railroad tycoon. Um, Vanderbilt becomes extremely wealthy because of this. His home, the Biltmore State, outside of Asheville, employed more people than the entire US Department of Agriculture at this point. Um, so his house alone, entire more than entire department of the government, how powerful these people were. So let's take a quick look at the lives of these people. Some of the richest, if not the richest people that ever lived. While the country grew greatly during this period, industry grew greatly, you see the United States grow into the economic power that it still is today. The robber barons were the ones who benefited from industrialization the most. They made the most money while the workers suffered the most. Um, the workers had the worst effects of this. They were didn't have enough wages a lot of times to barely even live while the robber barons were living well beyond their means. 
So you have to think about $100 is worth about $2,700 today, 27 times more. I mentioned before, Cornelius Vanderbilt built the Biltmore Estate. This is outside of Asheville, North Carolina, if anyone's ever been there. Um, this is a huge house. That is someone's house. Um, so think about that. His workers are repressed, but he is building this place. Um, there is just so much wealth at this time to these um, captains of industry or robber barons. Rockefeller Center in New York City is built on land um, and buildings that the Standard Oil Company built right in downtown Manhattan. Rockefeller owned this area. Um, this is probably some of the most expensive real estate in the world. Rockefeller actually owned much of the Grand Teton Mountains. Um, outside of Jackson Hole, you can see this is what he had in his backyard. He owned those mountains. His family owned that. Um, that's pretty amazing. Rockefeller also owned a large portion of Arcadia National Park, or what would become Arcadia National Park, um, in Maine. The islands around it, too, belong to Rockefeller. Um, so you see just how well these people are. Some of these landmarks today are owned by these private citizens who have so much money. But the robber barons also gave away a lot of money. They were some of the biggest philanthropists who ever lived. Um, they gave a great deal of land and money away. Rockefeller gave over $500 million to charities during his lifetime. Um, the Rockefeller Foundation is still one of the largest foundations for the arts in the country. Um, those areas I showed you, Grand Teton and Arcadia, are now national parks. The Rockefellers donated that money to the national government to make them um, national parks. So they gave that land over to the government. And also Carnegie Mellon and Vanderbilt universities were created as direct result from um, donations and creation by Andrew Carnegie and Cornelius Vanderbilt, two of the better um, universities in the country. So what you see is here is kind of the dichotomy between the wealth growth and the growth of industry. Um, the idea that people are getting so wealthy on the backs of workers, but also that the country is growing greatly. Um, so we will continue to see the effects as we go along in this unit.